the, the attempt to uh, solidify it um, in one coherent theory is, is, it, it hasn't, to my satisfaction, been, um, been done uh, at that masterful level. All right. um, the political apparatus and political ideology, there is a denial of false consciousness, which we talked about, and the ide ideological consent as necessary. Right? So ideological consent becomes necessary. So what we recognize now, right, now we can really get, we can really get to you, for the post-structuralist, um, is the following, right? I won't really say that this is a critique, but it's something to think about, right? If it's the case that interests and desires are, um, must conform to this necessity, right? We have, in a sense, a system of power. And this system of power is essentially your inexca your inex is, the power is itself inescapable. If you live within the territorial confines of whatever jurisdiction, you are subordinated by that power, right? And we'll talk about a collective of individuals, right? Not just one individual, right? So that power is um, imposed, is used in a sense to subjugate a class of people or a group of people, not for better or worse, it just, it just is, right? I don't have the same access to power or use to power that, that you do. It doesn't have to be so far as being subaltern, but just oppressed, right? It doesn't have to be the case that it's subaltern. We know that there is the subaltern, which would actually be a, a smaller class below the oppressed class to be technical. So now we can look at the uh, oppressed and we can look at the And there might be some tenuous ability to communicate with the um, those in control of power, but usually power is enforced to pacify. And what is being pacified? Our collective, potentially collective desire to revolt. It's always the case that this, this relationship between those in hegemonic power and those within the population, power is specifically being used continuously to pacify the population um, and get them not to want to revolt in sort of ghetto terms, right? So nonconformists, right, interests and desires then must conform to this necessity, right? Because consent becomes necessary, right, under the system. So that right? consent to be pacified becomes necessary in order for this structure to be preserved. If you refuse to consent, to be pacified, then what you're saying is that now I'm going to attack, we're going to collectively usurp the power, and thus revolution, civil war, so on. What, what's being stated here in fairness to post-structuralists, especially if we look at sort of the uh, Algerian War of Independence, right? What's, and use that specific moment in history as a reference, what's being stated here is that the collective body has, in a sense, tacitly consented to their own oppression, right? So that oppression, oppression becomes, B-C-O-N, the consequence of, uh, we'll say tenuous T-N-E-O, societal associated consent. Right. Oppression becomes a consequence of this tenuous societal uh, consent. Insofar as we have a collectively organized ourselves to fight against the powers that be, it's not the case that we don't know that that power is being used to keep us in our place, but we are consenting to that level of power. We're allowing that level of power to exist, which is obviously different from this Marxist conception wherein I don't even know that this power is being used to keep me in place, right? So that my keeping, my, my staying in my place is one of consent. Okay, I'll, I will stay in my place, right, tacitly. I'll stay in my place. Uh, there might be members in the population who want to usurp this power, but until we collectively arrive at that and I motivate others within the population, we're going to remain oppressed. Entirely different account from one of coercion, right, wherein there is a system that's constructed to keep me deceived. On this point, there is no such system of deception. We've consented. Um, albeit maybe not uh, explicitly, to 
our pacification, right, to our oppression. And this is obvious in a lot of the um, discourse on slavery. As we said, the slaves recognize that they're slaves. They recognize that they don't have the same advantages that the master has. Right? They recognize within the slave community that there's the house nigger and the field nigger. Right, that the house nigger has more advantages than the field nigger has. The field nigger doesn't have any advantages and is definitely subaltern. The, the house nigger might be oppressed, not subaltern, just arguably, right? The fact that they're in this system, it's not that there's this discourse that's been created, in fairness to post-structuralists, that there's this, this discourse of coercion and delusion that has been created. No, we recognize that, listen, they have the guns, they have the power, they have the power to feed us, they have the power to kill us. Let's just consent, right? So... Um, interests and desires then must conform to this necessity, the necessity of ideological consent as being necessary. But then nonconformists become a necessary consequence of this system. Now this is very important, right? And it wasn't easy for me to put this together. But if this is part of the structure, and I'm saying that it is part of the structure, then there's an, it's inevitable that at least one person, at least theori theoretically, is going to refuse to consent to the power, right? So that this person and, and these collective of people become the non-conformist, right? The non-conformists become troublemakers, right? So, I'll read it again. Interests and desires then must conform to this necessity, and this is the um, ideological consent as necessary. Ideo to be specific, ideological consent as a necessary consequence of society. Okay, there's inevitably going to be people who do not consent to that. Those people are nonconformists, right? So nonconformists become a necessary consequence of the system. This system, there is a recognition within, among those with power, that nonconformists become a necessary byproduct of this system. Thus, it is necessary is to look at the application of this, this notion um, within uh, Arendt's work. Now, Hannah Arendt herself wasn't, obviously, um, a post-structuralist. The reason why I'm using this citation um, is because I believe that the citation is a, a perfect emblematic um, articulation of this concept, right? And the idea is, in opposition to this Marxist elaboration of, 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 of oppression, in which oppression comes as a consequence of coercion, post-structuralists are saying, listen, oppression, subalternity, doesn't come as a consequence of hegemonic coercion, but from population consent, right? Um, this consent is societally based, so that we socially consent to adapt our behavior in line with those who have power, and obviously what's going to have happen as a byproduct of this system is that the vast majority of people will consent, but invariably, and those who orchestrate this power know this, invariably there will be those who refuse to consent. And these are the nonconformists, right? The nonconformists are a natural byproduct of this system. What ends up happening then is that the nonconformists, ideologically, right, instead of just looking at it as ideological nonconformity, I disagree with the way that you construct the system. That ideological nonconformity is transformed into physical nonconformity conform in a population of people who threaten the actual power of the system, right? These nonconformists threaten to undermine the power of the system. These are the revolutionaries. This is the vanguard, the avant-garde, and so on, right? So, these nonconformists are a threat to the power of the system. And what ends up happening is we externalize that threat in the physical body of those people. That group of people, those, they are a threat to us. Obviously, for genocide scholarship, this has direct implication for what I do in my analysis. So I, I particularly find this, this approach useful. Not to say that I'm a post-structuralist. Again, I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to um, post-structuralism. I don't... Um, I don't necessarily believe in the, the, the definition of post-structuralism, though I understand the concept, right? And I think more importantly than anything is the concepts are viable. The, the label, you know, scholars haven't attributed the label to themselves, and there's a ton of debate as to whether it actually exists.